This is a production of Cornell University. Klaus, I'll uh, turn it over to you, and, um, right. and yeah, Man, we'll take it from here. I planned some a little different direction, but seeing what Matt has got, I, I threw that out. And <laughs> <laughs> try to do something more complimentary, but I, I, wanna, I do want to preface it with some observations that I've made in general on farming systems. And that is, whenever we've had a major pest problem, and that could be a weed, like the perennials we talked about, be an insect. Uh, it could be a disease. Is this working? Yep. So it's only going to the three quarter. So okay. Yeah. So any any type of a pest that it crops up in a in a farming system can be seen as a problem in itself, and that gives you a very that's gives you a very different solution. Then the problem becomes how do you kill the pest? Or it can be seen as a symptom of the direction that your system has gone in. I have found more and more, and some, sometimes it's not real apparent, but by introducing the right new species to the system, we can change the system so that it doesn't become the ideal host for what we consider the problem. And I'm going to digress a little bit because I, we've got a perfect example that was done here at Cornell uh, of this concept but it's with a little different crops, and that's dry beans. Where, and that one of the early soil health tests came out of this, where we were growing dry beans and then waiting five years and coming back, and the same disease complex that had been in the roots of the dry beans was back almost as if we hadn't rotated. And we were blaming the varieties, we were looking for organic fungicides, until Georgia Bowie took me aside once and said this problem is nothing to do with your reactive stuff, it has to do with how you've been farming with what your system is. What he explained was that we were rotating to grasses and other legumes. The other legumes were co-hosts to the same set of problems that were in the dry bean roots. And specifically there were two problems that were building up because of our lack of diversity. Uh, one was the fungi the Pythium, Rhizoctonia, the Fusarium. The other was pathogenic nematodes, which were opening up the roots and creating a, a big highway for all the pathogens to move in. And whenever we had a wet spring, in that situation, we had the roots rot off and a lousy crop of beans. What George suggested was, why don't you mix up your system a little? Bring in some other species. Uh, wheat, and this, this is actually the perfect slide for it. After the corn, we decided to shift gears. We frost seeded yellow mustard. Yellow mustard gives off, uh, has glucosinolates in it. It gives off a cyanide gas. It biofumigates the soil, kills the pathogenic nematodes, but it also seems to get rid of the fungal complex. And within a couple of years of changing our system, our dry bean yields had gone from about 900 pounds to where we actually had one field that produced 4,000 pounds of dark red kidneys. It, on average, it doubled our yields just to add, a, and this would have been early spring, we frost seeded, no-till, after corn in March, yellow mustard, and incorporated it in June when it was time to plant the dry beans. The, the big concept here, I don't want to belabor that particular practice, uh, and we have to separate between systems and practices. You know, we've got a problem, and you described it really well, Matt, was uh, we tend to have this mindset of, I want to add this really good practice to a system, but if it's not compatible with the system, it's not going to work. So in, in this case, we changed our system to remove the reason that we had the buildup of the problem. Now, when we try to create a system that incorporates the rolled rye, and the no-till, uh, and again, this is a good example of how do we reimagine the system, but I think we're gaining quite a lot by having more diversity in our farm by eliminating some of these pitfalls that create pest problems. And I, there's a piece of research that I would love to see done here at Cornell, Penn State, or anywhere that they're willing to do it, is I believe every species that we grow changes the soil, and makes it the ideal environment for some other species, 
It makes it a terrible environment for some, make, it's probably neutral for others, and we have this spectrum. Just like with herbicides, there's a control spectrum. I would like to see <coughs> some work done on how these species interact. So when we put rye in to roll it, my observation is that rye is either neutral or beneficial to soybeans. It's extremely hazardous to some other species. In fact, once I thought I had a great idea, this was back when I first started talking with Matt, of taking other allelopathic species so that we could follow the rye with no-till sunflowers. Uh, that was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, rye will literally kill sunflowers. It's one of the most easily controlled species for the effects that the rye has. Now we call that allelopathy. I think we're, I think we're oversimplifying it. Allelopathy is ca plant chemicals that are given off by the roots, but there are other modes of action that are going on. A plant like rye that uses a lot of nitrogen is also suppressing species that need a lot of available nitrogen. Every species has a group of microbes in the soil. If we don't have the right microbes in the soil, then we're suppressing something. And that's where we got in trouble growing other legumes with dry beans. We were building up a, a lot of species in the soil that made that soil not be a healthy environment for the crop we were trying to grow. So this interspecies type of research, I think, could inform us in our no-till systems as to how do we use the cover crops as a way to improve the environment for the intended crop, and then how do we create it into a circle so that we're actually optimizing the system, using the right cover crops to give the desired conditions. A uh, few things that we've tried on the farm, and I'm, I'm way out ahead of the science here, but uh, we have to try new things to take observations, is we've noticed that if we put tillage radish in the fall with our winter grains, that we actually have a slight increase in yield. One to two pounds of tillage radish put in with winter wheat has given us an observed yield boost. We also have noticed that when we've had problems with the rolled rye, sometimes, even though it improves soil structure, if we've had really bad weather, and especially bad weather when we establish the rye, we've got some legacy effect of not really great soil structure. It makes the planter not work as good, makes it harder to get the seed placement where you want. So by putting the tillage radish in the system, our theory is, that we're going to be penetrating the soil, loosening it up, and actually mitigating possible legacy problems in the soil structure, improving the soil health. And if, it, as it a, if it's in at a population that helps or is neutral to the rye, we could, pre, we could be creating a better root situation for no telling into. I've seen suggestions that maybe we should be putting them in rows. That, that would be a really interesting concept. But again, I'm, I'm out ahead of where the science is. I'm trying to throw out ideas for Matt. I'll, I'll drive him crazy with ideas before. <laughs> so I realize I did a really bad job with introducing Klaus. And Klaus, can you just say a little bit about where you're at and oh. what you're farming? Okay, you know. I'm, I'm Klaus Martins. We're uh, certified organic farmers for over 20 years. Uh, we farm just an hour from here. We've worked very closely with Cornell uh, ever since I can remember. And a lot of the work that's been done here, we've cooperated with and advised. And, and I think it's been a very complementary thing where observations made in the field are being tested here. Uh, we're finding that uh, the research that is being done, I'm going to put in a plug for the farming systems trial. The long-term organic farming systems trial here was informed by what's happening out on farmers' fields. But at this point, it has uh, been consistent enough and has moved ahead far enough, so I think it's going to start informing what farmers do. You know, and that, that's been a real big benefit, and I think there's been a synergy between Cornell and the organic farmers in this region that has resulted in Cornell being ahead of most of the rest of the country on organic research, but also the New York farmers being ahead of farmers in other parts of the country. And I, have, I talk at a lot of Midwestern meetings where people come up and they're envious of us for living next to Cornell for the kind of support we've gotten and the quality of the research that has helped us move ahead in our yields. So I'm going to drop that part of the talk and go back to uh, adaptive management. And I think that's what you started talking about and it really is important. So we'll go back to 2016. We had planted 70 acres 
which was a big jump for us of rye for roll down. And believe it or not, we were much drier than Musgrave. Uh, we, had less, we had three inches less rain during the summer than Musgrave did. And that was kind of a disaster in terms of drought. Uh, we had three inches of rain total from May 26 until the end of the growing season. And it had gone six weeks with under an inch. So you can imagine what our no-till soybeans look like. They actually yielded only 200 pounds less than the ones at Musgrave. But we could have done really, really well. Because I, I did chicken out on our worst field when I saw how dry it was. And we decided to harvest it as rylage. The rylage was a really profitable crop because in the severe drought, forage prices doubled. So here's an adaptive management where even though we had to change our plan, we were able to change it to something more profitable. Now hindsight's 2020. I should have done that with all of our. <laughs> uh, in fact, one of our fields, somebody, somebody had grown hairy vetch once, and it was a mixture of hairy vetch and rye that was about nine tons, <laughs> to, or 9,000 pounds per acre of dry matter. The stuff was over the hood of a big tractor by about two feet. And imagine the forage that we could have harvested on that instead of getting a piddly 900 pound crop of soybeans. But what we followed that with, and because this was our worst field, we knew that there wasn't enough water. You couldn't even plow that land, it was so dry. So we no-tilled sorghum sedan grass into it. Sorghum sedan grass, it was, a, it was a BMR sorghum sedan, is able to tolerate much drier soil than soybeans. We actually harvested our biggest and most profitable crop off the poorest field because we had pulled a big crop of chopped rylage and then we pulled two cuttings of sorghum sedan. It's amazing you can get as much dry matter as you do from a crop like that. But this kind of adaptive management really drives researchers crazy because it can't be replicated. <laughs> it's kind of a seat of the pants thing. But it is, it's opportunities that we can build into a system like that. And by going from the, what would have been the crimped rye to harvesting forage, putting in sorghum sedan, we went back to a wintergreen, which made a good crop uh, the next year. So that, that's one of those adaptive management tools. Another adaptive management tool, and we've been talking with Aaron Silva in Wisconsin, is the system was developed at about Route 80. And rye is crimped at the right time of year to get the best soybean yield if you're at that latitude. We're l really close to Route 90, a little different latitude. There's about a 10-day discrepancy between when you ought to be planting soybeans and when you ought to be rolling the rye to terminate it. Uh, what they're doing in Wisconsin is just planting the rye when it's time, or planting the soybeans when it's time to plant soybeans, and then crimping the rye later when it's time to crimp the rye. When we were coming into the severe drought in uh, 2016, we actually had plenty of dry matter and we crimped well before anthesis to stop water loss. The reason we had even the 900 pounds with that really miserable drought was that we were able to stop much of the water loss. When we came back at about two weeks, the soybeans were this high and the rye was getting right back up. So we took the crimper and I tried several different things, but we went in the opposite direction. And we had, did no damage whatsoever to those soybeans running over them. And they were drilled, they were uh, narrow rows. But we didn't hurt them with the tires and we didn't hurt them with the crimper. And we were able to flatten and terminate those, that rye going in the opposite direction a couple of weeks later when it was time, when it was anthesis and it was time to terminate it. So I'd just like to say that in our, in our work here with our different planting date research, four different planting dates in, in the spring. Our high shields are always earlier than anthesis. Okay, so when we're going in, we're getting incomplete kill of the rye, yep. just like Klaus is saying, and that's when we're getting maximizing our, our uh, soybean yields. And so this idea of this threshold, you know, maximizing your biomass, I think, yeah, like you say, that, that may work better south of here. That's here, right. You know, we're cutting into our, our growing season too much, and we need to adapt so that we can get that, that soybean in on time and just deal with whatever we need to with the, the rye not being ready, either coming back and rolling it again or, or doing something else. And, uh, yeah. You know, but that's pretty consistent that we're seeing these higher yields earlier. So a couple of months ago, uh, we brought in somebody to do a program 
at our farm. And we talk about New York is too far north, and, you know, all these advantages you have at Route 80. But this guy was growing organic no-till grains and vegetables in Germany. And that would be like being up north of Toronto, far north of Toronto for the latitude he was working at. And he showed us some tools, some techniques, and some ideas that were giving him extremely successful results, far north of where it should be possible to do. In fact, I, uh, I met one of his classmates once. He'd, been, he'd went to school in Germany, and the professor was talking about no-till and saying organic no-till is very successful, talking about the Rodale system, but it can't possibly be done this far north. And this is one of these guys that you can picture him. He popped out and said, well, I've been doing it for three years. What's the problem? <laughs> That, I'm sure you love students that do that kind of thing. <laughs> so what uh, Jan Hendrik has done, he has uh, looked at what is it that tillage does and how do we achieve that without tillage? And I think those are really important questions to frame. So that, that kind of opens it up to more ideas. Uh, what he was, his goal was actually to grow vegetables. And he came up with the idea of transfer mulch. And he made some mental filters in his mind. These were rules that he farmed within. So he said one rule was, I'm not going to import any organic matter from off the field. So within those rules, he would take cover crop, like when you had the clover, if he didn't need it for mulch, didn't need it for anything else, he would uh, chop it and cover it to ferment and would store it. Or if he had uh, beds, he would chop the cover crop from between the beds and put it on the beds. He found that when you crimped and you didn't have enough biomass to control the weeds, you could bring in transfer mulch to get up to the right amount of biomass and control the weeds. The other thing he found with the transfer mulch, and this is the other thing tillage does, is it produces it releases fertility. You know, when you till, you start a biological fire in the soil. You're burning up organic material and releasing minerals that the crop that's growing hopefully needs at the right time as when they're released. Because if, you're, if you do tillage that releases these minerals not when the crop needs them, it's basically recreational tillage and you're putting stuff out there that the, either is going to leach into the water or the weeds are going to use it. And that, that's one of the problems of tillage. It, it can actually increase weeds even though it's a tool used to reduce weeds. So he started looking at how much mulch does it take to control the weeds, but also what composition of mulch do you need, what CN ratio, and what chop length, so what particle size, to release fertility in time with when the crop needs it. Now those concepts really stretched my thinking, and he, uh, along with these concepts, he said, well, let's look at this crimper. And when you use this, the organic matter lasts the longest. And we had a little discussion about the temperature. So he said, how about if I sharpen the backside of those blades and put a hitch on the other end? So now if he wanted the organic matter to last as long as possible, he would run it the way we're doing here. If he was in a hurry, if he wanted to warm the ground up quicker and wanted it to break down faster, remember it's a, it's a cool, damp, environment where he is, he would run it in the other direction and it would chop. And he could speed up the degradation and the breakdown by about 40%. Uh, then he got a machine that would, actually it was a flail mower, it's a little higher tech than the ones we have here, that would cut right to the surface and shred the material. And that would increase the breakdown speed by more than double. So that gave him some tools that he could use to make those disadvantages that he had into advantages. There's no reason we can't be using those tools. I would love to see some work done here with, you know, what happens if we use, use this for chopping. You know, maybe if we're crimping, the second time over we ought to be cutting. That could be cutting the heads off late enough so that we're not getting the grain ripening afterwards. So. Sorry, I'm not giving you a whole lot of answers here. I'm just trying to throw out questions for the researchers. <laughs> I appreciate that comment. <laughs> so, so I think uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we should probably shift gears and have uh, a 
Hendrick was also using uh, mixtures, and he, he was doing prescriptions depending on what you were going to plant afterwards and when it was going to be planted for things that would be later or earlier. So it was not just the mechanical, but yeah. this, this is work that's really compatible with what you're doing. Yeah. One more question? Um, the, I think one of the barriers to growers implementing some of these practices is the cost of the equipment. Um, and so I've seen growers, and flail mowers are more expensive than the rotary mowers, but I've seen people use flail mowers as rollers. Have you done anything? You just don't run it with the, uh, you don't turn the PTO on, you just drag it over the field. Have you that? Uh, I've actually tried uh, cultimulture. Oh. I've never done the, the mower, but uh, this, was, this was actually one of Jan Hendrick's point. He said he didn't have a lot of money, yeah. and he said a lot of farmers don't. He said just try things. You know, and it's, the Calder Mulcher did a great job for me, but this, this crimper isn't that expensive, at least on, and the uh, no-till planters and drills can be rented. Well, not, not in some ways. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a good challenge for your conservation district. Uh, in our county, the conservation district had one for 20 years. Yeah. Now there are five of them in the area that are for rent that farmers have. It, it's uh, really important to have the right equipment, though. If you try to do some of the work, you know, uh, have a planter, for example, I mean, in grain crops, you know, corn and soybean, uh, you know, if you're trying to go in with a, uh, a standard planter that's not set up for no-till, you're, yeah, you're just going to be running into problems. I, I worked with a farmer who had a brewing cedar and he dragged it behind the rover with sorghum. So, you know, it's like the Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a neighbor who is a brilliant no-tiller, uh, he's conventional. He bought an old single disc drill and he waits until a rain and he gets his cover crops to start as nice as the people who spent $50,000 on a drill. That's about a $1,500 machine. Just, but he waited for conditions to be right. So when the soil was soft enough, that single disc opened it up and he got a stand. All right, well thanks Klaus. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.